We pray for us. We pray for our hearts to be uh, open to hearing from you, God, and we give you glory for what you're about to do in this sermon. So then we pray. Amen. Amen. I promise I didn't tell you, him and I are also remaking Rush Hour 4 soon, so that's, a, <laughs> that's what's really going on, okay? Well, good morning. It's good to be here, as always, and an honor to start a new sermon series together. I want to tell you a story, another story, before we start. Um, so before I became... Um, joined full-time ministry, I used to be a kindergarten teacher. And so as a kindergarten teacher, of course, we told a lot of stories, story time, circle time with our children. And so I'm going to tell you one of the favorite stories I used to share with my kindergarten class, okay? It's called Tadpole's Promise. All right, so crisscross applesauce, if everyone's sitting comfortably, I'm going to tell you a story. (laughs) Once upon a time, on the edge of a beautiful pond where the willow met the bay, lived a beautiful tadpole and a caterpillar. They were best friends, the tadpole and the caterpillar, and were deeply in love with each other. The tadpole would call the caterpillar his beautiful rainbow, and the caterpillar would call the tadpole her beautiful black pearl. I love everything about you, the caterpillar would say to the tadpole. You are my beautiful black pearl. Promise me you'll never, ever change. And the tadpole said, I promise, I promise you that I will never change. But the next time they met, the tadpole had grown two little legs. And the caterpillar was heartbroken. You broke your promise to me, tadpole. You said you would never change, but now you have legs. And the tadpole said to the caterpillar, I'm sorry, I don't want these legs at all. All I want is my beautiful rainbow. And so the caterpillar said, okay, I'll forgive you but promise me you will not change anymore. And the tadpole, I promise, I promise you I will not change. But sure enough, the next time they met, the tadpole changed again. He had arms, then he had lost his tail, and each time he would make a promise not to change, he could never keep his promise. He kept on changing. And so in the end, the caterpillar said to him, you have broken my heart too many times, tadpole. You are not my shiny black pearl anymore. The tadpole thought to himself, but you will always be my beautiful rainbow. I'm sorry. You've changed too much. I never want to see you again. And with that, the caterpillar crawled up onto the highest branch she could find, and she cried and cried. She cried so hard and so long that she formed a cocoon around her (laughs) and fell asleep for a very long time. Now, some time passed, and when the caterpillar woke up, everything had changed. She was now a butterfly with beautiful wings. The season had changed. The sun was shining. The grass was green. The flowers had bloomed. But what didn't change was what she had in her heart for her shiny black pearl. And so she decided to fly down to the river to find him and to forgive him. And as she flew down to the river, a frog was sitting on the lily pad. Excuse me, Mr. Frog, have you seen my... But before she could say beautiful black pearl, the frog jumped up and ate up the butterfly in one big gulp. (laughs) Emotional damage, oh man, wow. (laughs) What a story. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. (laughs) Well, what a story, right? In those two minutes, we went on a roller coaster of emotions. Right? You guys were listening. There was love, friendship, cuteness, heartbreak, shock, and horror. You were drawn in. You were listening to the story. Why? Right? Because stories carry power. Stories are powerful. Right? Which is often why when people want to teach something or explain something, they do so through stories. Right, we have not just this story, fairy tales, countless fairy tales, right? these cute little stories which often have a deeper meaning behind them. And Jesus knew this. In fact, a lot of how Jesus taught, Jesus tos, chose to teach through stories because the, he knew they had power. And the stories Jesus told are known as parables. And if you read through the Gospels, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus taught through these parables to draw people in, to get them invested, but to make them think about truths, 
truths about his message, truths about the kingdom of heaven, and to declare him who he was and the character of God. These parables, as people heard them, invited hearers into a new reality that Jesus was trying to open their eyes to. The fact that the kingdom of heaven is surely but slowly taking over this earth. But the difference is that Jesus' stories weren't just supposed to be like cute little tales that he told with a little moral truth. They were actually meant to shock and to shake our world. In fact, one of the reasons why Jesus had to use parables to teach was because some of the things he was talking about were so countercultural, so shocking, and so different from what other people were saying that if he had said it directly, people would have um, arrested him straight away. Which is why people told, uh, Jesus told parables and stories. But then it's also why then he had to explain them, tell them what is this story really about. Again, because they were so powerful and so dangerous. He had to veil them with the story, but then he would go on and explain the truth of them. And these stories, even though they're over 2,000 years old, still ring true today. So like Promise told us earlier, over the next four weeks, we're going to look at some of these beloved stories of Jesus. And together we're going to study them, we're going to wrestle with them, and we're going to ask ourselves how these ancient stories continue to speak truth into our life and our journey with Jesus today. It's going to be good, I really hope so. And today we're going to start with the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. Now, um, do you guys remember... Um, what chia pets were? Do, are they still around? Chia pets, right? Chia pets were like these potato-looking lump, okay, that you soak them in some water, and you water them, and then you put them against the windowsill. Or maybe that's the first sign experiment. Some, some of you guys did get that little seed, right, and put it in the cotton. And then sure enough, right, after some time, the seed sprout or the chia seed grows green hair, and that's how they grow. That's how things work, right? Seeds are meant to bear fruit, Seeds grow. That's what they're supposed to do. In fact, it's all in a part of God's design of how he created this world to work. On the third day of creation, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. So seeds are supposed to grow. Seeds are supposed to bear fruit. But in order for seeds to grow and to bear fruit... They need good soil. In fact, you could even say that soil and fruit-bearing seeds are essential for our survival as humans on this earth. Maybe it's not something we think about all the time, but um, next time you go into a supermarket or something, you're at Park and Shop or Welcome or whatever, take a look at all the products, right? Or when you go to the wet market. There's fruits, there's vegetables. Now, they're all neatly made in front of us. You know, we can just go and buy them and bring them home and, and prepare our meals and stuff. But think a bit further um, sometimes. Where did this stuff come from? Right, The shelves that are fully well stacked with products, it's easy to forget that all this is actually a produce of farming, of agriculture, where seeds had to be planted, were sown into soil, and then these seeds bear fruit that becomes our food, or it's the food our food eats sometimes, right? The entire world is reliant on seed and good soil. In fact, I wrote a little poem, a little haiku, okay, to describe this. Listen. If the soil is bad, the seeds do not bear us food. Without food, we die. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you're right. It's to the point, short and to the point. Thank you, thank you. (laughs) Now, like I said, for us, you know, we're a bit detached from this reality. Um, But the realities and difficulties in agriculture were a lot more obvious for the people in Jesus' time. They would have understood immediately the importance of good farming and seeds that produce a fruit, which is perhaps why often Jesus used farming and agriculture as a way to illustrate his point, right? Seeds and conditions of soil and what bears fruit, what doesn't bear fruit. And so this is the heart behind Jesus' parable, So we're about to read it, and then after that, we're going to walk through the parable to uh, learn what Jesus has to say about his kingdom through this story. It starts in Luke chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, 
proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, whom had seven demons had come out, Jonah, the wife of Husa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and who had came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seeds fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Now, on the surface, it seems like a pretty straightforward story. A farmer goes out, you know, does his thing, sows his seeds with various results. But when we think about it, when we look a bit deeper, there are some unusual elements to this story. Firstly, the method of planting seed, the method the farmer used, was a bit unusual. Normally, care was taken to make sure that seed wasn't just scattered on the way um, that you, the, the name for doing this in farming is called broadcasting, right? So normally, farmers wouldn't just scatter seed all over the place. But rather, usually, intention was taken to put seeds in a place where it had the best chance to grow. Remember also, right, Jesus started by saying, I'm talking about the good news of the kingdom of God. So within this context, people were listening to the story thinking, well, what do seeds and birds and thorns and hard ground, all that kind of stuff, have to do? What, do that, what does that have to do with God's kingdom? Now, here's what's important for us today. You have just heard this parable. Right? You've heard the story, it's drawn you in. Maybe as I was reading, you had pictures of farmer throwing seed everywhere, pictures of seed landing in different types of ground. But with listening to what we're about to say, we're going to talk about the explanation. And so in listening to explanation, there is also going to come expectation and responsibility. This is why Jesus says, Whoever has ears, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of kingdom of God has been given to you. And so we are going to look into these secrets of the kingdom of God. Explanation that Jesus has given to us. We're about to get into the meaning of this parable. If you have ears today, you're about to hear. You're going to see and you're going to understand, hopefully, what Jesus is trying to teach us. Now, but like I said... This comes with expectation and responsibility. But because you're about to hear, you're about to see and understand, this is going to, it should change your world. Because we're talking about understanding God's heart and his kingdom. And it's going to challenge us to do something with the message, with the seed we're about to hear today. We're talking about revealing secrets of God's kingdom. Once you've seen, once you've heard, once you've understood, you have no excuse. And so what I'm saying right now is if you don't want that responsibility, maybe it's best for you can put in some AirPods right now, okay? Or I won't even be offended if you go downstairs to PCC, grab a coffee or something. It's half price coffee today, by the way, right? Because Hong Kong won the gold medal, right? So yeah, <laughs> congratulations, Hong Kong. <laughs> Amazing. But honestly, if you wanted to leave right now, I wouldn't be offended. But I hope you will stay. Because what I've said, through understanding these parables, we are going to get to know more about who Jesus is and how he's called us to live. And this is what being a follower of Jesus is all about, isn't it? This is what our lives should be about. So if you're ready, let's hear the explanation. Well, Jesus says it himself. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. So, okay, so there's our first reveal. It seems that this is a teaching about how God's, how God's word works in the different types of soil. Now, notice this, though. The interesting is that throughout the story, the seed is the only consistent thing. The seed is consistent. 
The soil changes, but the seed never changes. As it says in Scripture, the grass withers, the flowers fail, but the word of God endures forever. Now, the way the farmer is sowing the seed is through scattering. Like I said just now, um, scattering was an unusual practice because it was seen as wasteful. In a time where food was scarce and needed to be grown properly, you wouldn't want to waste your seed like that. The seed was a precious commodity for the farmer. So the usual practice would be make sure the seeds were put in places where they had potential for growth. So why the scattering of the seed? Why is Jesus telling the story this way? Well, I think what he's trying to tell us is this, that the scattering of seed, remember the seed represents God's word, the scattering of the seed highlights the fact that the word of God is everywhere and for everyone. Right? There is an unusual sense of generosity about how the farmer is scattering his seed. There's almost like a joy about it. You can almost picture him doing, yeah, I'm just going to spread it everywhere. It doesn't matter where it lands. I'm just gonna... My aim is to spread it as far and wide as I possibly can. Right? He's not eking out a living, being really stingy with the seed. He's not thinking about the seed running out because he knows there is more than enough. Right? It will never run out. This is what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to say that God's word is abundant, right? And God's heart, his desire is for everyone to be able to encounter it, to be able to hear it. God's desire is that nobody shall perish, but everyone has a chance of hearing his word. And what do we know about his word? His word is powerful, right? The seed carries with it the potential for growth. Right? And the potential of God's word that we carry is also the truth of his love, his salvation, and the great potential to bear fruit. Disciples making more disciples. But see, this is what happens. What happens to the seed, though, depends on the condition of the soil it lands in. And there's a few different types of soil. The first one is this. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Okay, so this is the second reveal. The seed is God's word, and the soil represents people and the condition of our hearts. And so for the seed that falls along the path, it tells us it's trampled on, and the devil snatches the word away. The devil snatches the rest of the seeds away. It's important to notice, though, that these people have heard God's word. It's not the hearing that that they've heard God's God's word. The problem is that they don't put their belief in God, and so they don't receive salvation. They're not saved. They don't believe, therefore they're not saved. The heart that is hard, a hard heart, will never be able to receive God's word. In addition to this, We have an enemy, like we said a couple of weeks ago, that is actively trying to stop the word of God from taking root and bearing fruit in people's hearts. In in people's hearts, right? The enemy's aim is the complete opposite of what God is trying to do. Now, again, notice it's not God that stops the seed from taking root; it's the hardness of the path. It's the bird that snatches it away. And Jesus is not shy in telling us the consequences of a hardened heart. Because the heart is hard and does not believe, these people are not saved. So that they may not be saved, meaning they are not rescued and brought out of the consequences of sin and darkness. They do not have the life now and the eternal life that Jesus promises for those who follow them. Now, if you look back at the story of Luke, until this point, Jesus has actually met a bunch of people with hard hearts. People like the Pharisees and the religious leaders who refused to listen to Jesus. The villagers in his home, own hometown of Nazareth who drove Jesus out and even tried to throw him off a cliff and kill him. The hardened heart will always reject Jesus and the life and salvation only he can provide. So here's the question today as you're listening. Has your heart been hardened? Scripture tells us, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And one of the first things I want to say this morning is that for those of you who have heard God's word, 
but not yet let it sink into your hearts. I really urge you today to really, really consider this question. Have you let the Word of God sink into your hearts? Have you received it, and not just heard it, but received it, and started to put your belief in it? Because if you haven't, the consequences is literally one of eternal life with Jesus or eternal separation from Him in darkness. So that's the hard heart. But there's also those on the rocky ground. These are the ones that receive God's word with joy when they hear, but they have no root. They believe for a little while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. So the second group of people are called the rocky ground. Like we're saying, right, the seed will grow, but only if the conditions are right. And so in the same way, unless God's word actually takes root in your heart, it will not be long-lasting. It's like getting a gym, gym membership at the cusp of a new year, going for a few weeks and giving it up again. Or like, you know, the instrument that you swore you'd pick up and practice every day, but now the guitar just sits in the corner gathering dust, and you don't know it's out of tune, you don't know what to do with it anymore. Okay? The same thing happens when it comes to our faith. Right? Receiving God's Word is an exciting moment. Maybe even getting baptized, that moment is so excited. Think back to a time when you first put your faith in Jesus. Right? Joy is such a perfect word to describe that moment. The hope that you felt, the you know, troubles of this world have finally been lifted. Yes, I believe in Jesus now. Everything's going to be okay. I feel great. But then the adrenaline wears off. And the moment passes. And the reality of life starts to hit you again. You start to face struggle and testing, and then your faith, you find sometimes, begins to shrink. This is a word for us in this room, because there is a danger that this could be us. This could be us in this room today, and we do not want to be in this category. Right? Most of us in this room, the majority of us, have received God's word. And we might even have believing in it for a while. The question is, has it taken root in your heart? Because if it has not, Jesus says, when testing comes, you will fall away. And following, falling away from your faith is as though you'd never believed in the first place. The consequences of people in this category are the same as those with a hard heart. Now this perhaps is one of the most difficult truths about following Jesus. Following Jesus does not automatically make life easier. A, a relationship with Jesus is not a magic pill to take away life's problems. In fact, many times believing in Jesus will bring testing into your life. And testing comes in different forms, right? Sometimes it comes from temptations, the desires of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, as Scripture divides it, um, describes it. And when these things come knocking on your door, when they come to test you, we give in when God's Word hasn't fully taken root in our lives. Despite the moment of joy that we felt, the temptations overwhelm us and we fall away. Sometimes, though, this testing is even orchestrated by God. Scripture also tells us very clearly, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. But this is the kind of testing that is designed to refine us, to burn away and cut away things of our life that are not of him, that are not of Christ, so that we can live more like Jesus. But sometimes when these testing comes too, we reject them, we resent them, we refuse to believe and we refuse to be changed and disciplined and discipled. And so we too fall away. But Jesus is asking too much, like Jethro was praying just now. He's demanding too much of my life. Only a heart that is deeply rooted in the Lord will withstand all the testing of life. And we need to be sure that we're not just fair weather Christians because there is no such thing. Faith that only appears for a short time is no faith at all. 
church. This is a warning. This is a pleading. Do not abandon the love that you first had. We don't want to be like dogs that return to their own vomit. Right? We are called to be a people that endures and endures to the end. We are called to have a joy in our hearts that is there to stay no matter what comes. And for this to happen, the root of God's word must set in your heart. Now there's another group of people. This is the seed that falls among the thorns. And these stands for those who hear, but as they go on the way, they are choked up by life's worries and riches and pleasures. And so they do not mature. The third group of people are likened, um, and their hearts are likened to seed that grows up amongst the thorns. All right, the thorns of life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And just like the seed before, there is some growth, but this growth is stunted. It's like an arrested development of these, of these seeds, right? They are stunted because of the things of this world. Now, you don't need me to tell you, but the worries in this life are plenty. We, we want to put on a brave face all the time. We want to walk around and appear as though as nothing you know, has happened. Everything is fine. But life is full of worries, right? In this season, I, I can testify, I'll say to you right now, worrying is probably one of the biggest struggles right now. I worry for, my, my, my worries look like these days for my family about able to afford sending our children to school, right? Pay the school fees. School bills are expensive, okay? Schooling in Hong Kong can be expensive. Whilst trying to save money, whilst trying to save for retirement, put food on the table, pay the rent, all this kind of stuff. This kind of stuff keeps me up at night sometimes. At the same time, my two sons have a genetic condition um, inherited from me, right, that requires constant, it's a long-term thing. For the rest of their lives, they're going to have to have doctor's visits and observation. Day to day, they're doing fine, okay, but it's a worry because each and every doctor visit we have, I never know what the doctor is going to say. Right? Some of these doctor visits have been great. Oh, yeah, he's doing fine. Some of these doctor visits have been like, ooh, what's that? We've got to keep an eye on that. And those things worry me. That's a reality in my life. I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't worried about these things. What about you, though? What are some of the worries, things that keep you up at night? Do you ever feel these are in danger of arresting your faith in Jesus? All right, well, I have the answer. What do we do when we worry, right? Just pray more, right? Just pray more and everything will be fine. You just pray, ask God to take care of these worries and, and take them all away so in, and then pray for blessings, riches and pleasures. And when you have those things, then everything will be fine and your faith in God will be great. Now, the interesting about, thing about this part is that riches and pleasures are also included in the list of things that can choke out your relationship with God. Isn't that interesting? Proponents of the prosperity of the gospel will certainly have you believe that riches and pleasures are always what God wants to lavish on us. And can God bless us in this way? And has he blessed us before in this way? Absolutely. But beware. We see the problem of worry, but there is also the problem of pleasure. And it works itself out in two ways. Firstly, we might spend all our time just chasing pleasure. That's all we ever pray about when we talk to God. We want God to bless us, take away our troubles, take away our worries, make a, give us the most comfortable life that we can have, the least amount of pain, the most amount of resources. And we only go to God when we're seeking these things. He becomes like, a, like an endorphin hit, like a pleasure machine, like a, like a slot machine that we put our hope in. Please, God, you know, give me a healing now. Oh, no, not this time. Okay. And we keep on pulling that lever and when we don't get the pleasures, our faith falls away and it doesn't grow. Or on the other hand, some of us have these things. We're living that life. And our life has become so sufficient and so self-sustaining and resourceful, we don't even think about God anymore. Or everything we need, everything we have, I can get, I have access to. And our lives become like the rich young ruler. Oh, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus challenges the rich young ruler. Well, okay, give up all your stuff and then you can come and follow me. And in the end, he doesn't. He can't take Jesus intruding into his life. And we don't want to be the ones who have to sacrifice our pleasures in order to follow Jesus. And the consequence is the same. Our faith doesn't mature. 
It doesn't mature because we want Jesus on our own terms. And we're either constantly distracted by worries or we're constantly distracted by the riches and pleasure. And look, in the end, with these people, there isn't even a mention of faith whatsoever. There is no faith. Church, I pray that as a body, as believers, as followers, we will not get choked out by the realities of life. And the one thing I'm working on in this area, the thing I feel like keeps me grounded and closest to Jesus in this time when I'm worried about things or things of this life overwhelm me or when things get a bit too comfortable is the, is the word contentment. Like Paul says, right? I have known what it's like to have little. I have known what it's like to have more than enough. But in every situation, I am content. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. It's like Paul saying to, um, to begging Jesus, Jesus, please take this thorn away from my flesh. Three times he begs, and three times Jesus says no. Instead, he responds, it's my grace is sufficient for you. And that was enough for Paul. Contentment is how we keep ourselves close to Jesus, to keep our faith nurtured to keep God's word rooted in our hearts when we're faced with the worries and the pleasures of life. Okay, no good news so far, right? Okay, it's been a bit heavy. I understand that. It's coming, all right? These soils, because, have not allowed the seed to do what it was supposed to do, which is to grow, to mature, to take root, and to bear fruit. In other words, I think what Jesus is trying to say is... If your life and your heart represent soil that is hard or is is rootless or gets choked out, you have not yet really truly stepped into a relationship with me. Because if you had, this is what life would be like. This is the kind of heart, this is the kind of people that Jesus is looking for. The seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Notice how God defines noble and good. People who hear and retain are noble and good. This is what happens when seed meets good soil. These people don't have hard hearts. They have hearts that are noble and good. These are the kind of hearts that don't fall away or don't get choked out by worries and pleasure because they persevere, or persevere, sorry, This is the kind of heart, when the seed meets the soil, the seed is able to fulfill its potential to do what it's meant to do and to produce a crop, to bear fruit. This is the point of discipleship. This is the aim of following Jesus with your life. True discipleship, a true sign of whether or not you really have a heart that follows Jesus is to see whether or not you have fruit to show for it. But the key word here is this. perseverance is the key. Because crop, fruit, doesn't just pop up overnight. Right? Those chia pets, as gimmicky as they are, right, takes time to grow. The only way this, this, this crop grows, the only way the fruit comes is through time. It's through persevering. Right? It's, in other words, it's not that the enemy hasn't maybe tried to snatch the seed away. It's not that the good seed and the good soil is free from testing and temptations. It's not that the seed is free from worries of riches and pleasures and everything that comes with life. This soil had probably had to deal with all these things as well. But the key difference is, is that they persevere. They don't give up. It requires a lifetime of response to consider what one's soul looks like to a slowly developing crop. Fruit does not appear overnight. Neither does the harvest of our heart. Which is why the Bible tells us time and time again, be strong and courageous. Endure. It is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. We will reap what we sow when we don't give up. Run with endurance the race that is set before you, church. A fruitful life looks like a faith. It looks like a life alive with faith. That's when we see the crop. That's when we see the fruit of, of, a, of, a, of a heart that has God's word taken root in it. 
So again, what does this look like? Um, Luke actually gives us some examples. Just as he gave examples of people that didn't listen to the word of God and root didn't take in their heart, there are good examples of this too. So a fruitful life looks like the woman who were with Jesus at the beginning of our story. Right? When I began reading this message, right, I began in Luke, chapter, in Luke 8, verse 1, intentionally, because it describes a group of women whom Jesus had healed, cast out demons, healed from diseases, and, but look what their response is. Jesus, Luke tells us that Jesus helped these women. He had healed them, but now their response was, these women were helping to support Jesus' ministry out of their own means. Right? They didn't let their resources, they didn't like the, the pleasures and the comfort that came with what they had stop their faith in Jesus. Rather, they used it to serve him and his ministry. Luke shares the story of the Roman centurion who had so much faith, he told Jesus, you don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy of you coming to my house for you to heal my servant, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. That's what fruit looks like. The faith on display is the sinful woman who broke open, perfumed the most precious thing she had in order to honor and anoint Jesus' feet. A faith on display is John the Baptist living a life in the desert, eating locusts and honey. People thought he was crazy. People thought he was mad. But he dedicated his life to proclaiming the word of God, to prepare the way of the coming of the Messiah. That was what his life mission was about, and nothing could stop him from doing that. And so here's the surprising end of this passage. Actually, it's not a coincidence that Jesus' teaching about a lamp on the stand actually comes at the end of this parable. Because the lamp on the stand is actually another mini parable, trying, Jesus trying to explain what he has just said. A lamp is meant to what? Shed light and not be hidden. A seed is meant to bear fruit and not to be snatched up or growthless. A follower of Jesus is meant to live a life of faith, rooted in the word of God, and then inspires others to do the same. Church, if you have ears today, then we need to hear. What kind of soil do we want to be? You know, as I was thinking about this, it brought me all the way back to Genesis. And it sounds like Andrew, I know, okay? But it brought me back to Genesis. Because when God created human beings, how did he create us? He created us from the soil, right? We were, God formed us out of the soil and breathed his life into us. God created you to be that soil, to be that soil where once his word is planted in you, would take root and bear fruit to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in your life. Because we have a world out there that is starving and hungry and they need to know who they are and who God sees them and how much God loves them. And without seed that bears fruit, this whole world is going to be hungry and die without him. And that's not, what we, that's not the world we want to see. That's not the society we want to build. That's not what God's kingdom looks like. God's kingdom is about bearing fruit and fruit that bears even more fruit, a thousandfold, a hundredfold. Church, what kind of soil do we want to be? May we be the kind of soil that God's, root can, that God's word can take root and grow and bear fruit for ourselves, for our lives, for the city and for the world that so desperately needs him. Would you pray with me? Now, as a community, as a body of Christ here, we, we talk about our vision for ourselves. The vision that we feel like God's given to us is to grow big people. And like we've been talking about, in order for growth to happen, God's word has to, first of all, take root. And so maybe right now, it's just a time just to quieten down and think about, has your heart been hardened? It, are you sitting here maybe with a hard heart right now? And, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. But you feel like I've heard God's word before. I just can't bring myself to believe in it. 
I pray that today that that hardness would be broken and that you would allow God's word to the seed to take plant in your heart and begin to take root for some of us we have testings and we've we've been through a lot and we're going through a lot and we're at the verge of giving up if I can't take any more if, if I'm tested if there's one more thing that comes up I don't know where I'm going to be take heart trust in the Lord his word is faithful and it's true and he will he is with you he is walking beside you he is using those things for your good and for the glory of his purposes and maybe for some of us we are worried about life or we've been so caught up with the the good things that life has presented it with us with that we've barely given a thought to the Lord recently again come back to the Lord don't let those things distract you but keep your eyes focused Speak contentment over yourself. Knowing that with Jesus, we have more than enough. So that we can bear fruit. We can be that good soil that Jesus talks about at the end. And for those of us who are there, who, who want to get there, our prayers to persevere, to press on, to endure, to push through. So that we can see God's faithfulness in the end. Give him the praise. Give him the glory. Live our lives for him and inspire others to do the same. So Jesus, may you make us the good soil that you've called us to be. May your, root, may your word take root and bear fruit in our lives as individuals, as family, as a community, as your church here in this city. We pray in your name, Lord.